Dear all, a very warm welcome to this webinar, which brings together scholars and decision makers to launch the report Sweden as an elected member of the UN Security Council, promoting women, peace and security as core council business. This is the first publication coming out of a collaboration between PRIO, Uppsala University, and the Nordic Africa Institute, NAI, on the role of elected members in the Security Council. My name is Henrik Udal, and I'm the director of the Peace Research Institute Oslo, PRIO. I'm glad to announce that the report is now freely available to download from the homepages of PRIO and NAI. The report has been made possible by the generous financial support of the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and additional research time from the Folkebeiner.academy, Academy, FBA, and NAI as part of the Shattering Glass project funded by the Swedish Research Council. I also want to express our gratitude to the personnel at the Norway's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the permanent mission to UN in New York for their important support in carrying out the project. Further, on behalf of the research team, I would like to warmly thank the interviewees at the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Swedish Permanent Mission to the UN for sharing so generously their time and knowledge with us, in particular Margot Wallström, Olaf Skog, Anders Sjöldbrand, Karoline Vrettem and Thomas Wicklund. And thanks not least to Annika Söder and Karl Skau, who are also contributing to the program today. I also want to express our appreciation to all those that have contributed as interviewees from UN member states, the UN Secretariat, and the non-governmental and academic communities in New York and globally. And finally, congratulations to lead author and project leader Louise Olsson and the entire research team, Angela Movumba Selström, Patty Chang, Torgen Tryggestad, Peter Wallenstein and Ingeborg Finnbach. I know that the expectations for this project have been high, and I'm very pleased to see that the team delivers so convincingly on those expectations. At PRIO, we are exceptionally proud to be associated with this report. We wanted to make use of this launch to continue the dialogue on the role of elected states in the UN Security Council. I want to warmly thank our presenters for taking the time to contribute their important insights. I'm also very glad to see that so many could join us here today in the audience. This webinar should be seen as part of PRIO's broader engagement during Norway's term on the Security Council 2021 to 22, where we plan to hold a series of webinars and to engage in the debate. Only last week, I had the privilege to moderate a roundtable discussion on how climate is addressed in the Council. This roundtable was part of our work with the Dialogue Forum for Norway's membership in the UN Security Council, organized jointly between NUPI, the Norwegian Institute for Foreign Affairs, the Norwegian Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, and incidentally, led at PRIO by Louise Olsson. For Norway, women, peace and security constitutes a key priority for the two-year elected term on the Security Council. This is a theme that we have followed closely at PRIO for almost two decades through our research and outreach activities of the PRIO Gender, Peace and Security Center. I'm therefore very glad to see women, peace and security being the core theme of today's webinar. We have an ambitious program, so let me uh, give you a short overview. First, we are going to listen to a presentation on Sweden's work in the Security Council. This will provide us with a background for understanding what it can mean in practice for an elected state to promote the realization of women, peace and security, and what Sweden's current priorities are in the UN. We will then go on to present the content of the report and discuss research implications a section of the program offering a great opportunity to again engage with the FBA. PRIO has greatly appreciated this collaboration over the many years. And as one example, in relation to the 20th anniversary of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 last year, PRIO, FBA, and UN Women edited a joint policy brief series together. 
And personally, I have over many years benefited greatly from being a member of the Folkebana.academy 1325 research group. After the presentation of the report, we will have a Nordic dialogue involving perspectives from Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. From a researcher's perspective, this is particularly interesting as this dialogue allows for considering developments over time as Sweden has recently left the council, Norway is currently on the council, and Denmark is preparing its campaign for an elected seat. This ambitious program unfortunately means that we will not have time for any direct questions from the audience during the webinar, but I will encourage you all to post questions during the Q&A uh, using the Q&A function. We are very interested in your thoughts and suggestions and will consider them going forward. Before I conclude, I want to express how much we at PRIO have appreciated a, co uh, a cooperation with um, Uppsala University and uh, the Nordic Africa Institute in organizing this event and in carrying out the project. We look forward to a continued fruitful collaboration. Now, uh, I want to introduce our first speaker, Carl Skau, Deputy Director General and Head of Department for UN Policy, Conflict and Humanitarian Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Sweden. Carl was ambassador and deputy representative to the UN Security Council at the permanent mission of Sweden to the UN during Sweden's term on the council. Finally, I want to introduce Togen Tryggesta, PRIO deputy director and director of the GPS center at PRIO, who will take us into the next section of this seminar uh, following Carl's presentation. But first, Carl, we are very glad that you could be with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Henrik, and, and the pleasure is mine uh, to have the opportunity to be here and to also, uh, you know, I'm very curious to listen to the presentation of your report uh, to which we were, we were interviewed. As you said, I'm uh, now heading the UN department here in Stockholm, but uh, during our council term, I was in New York working on, uh, on the council as, as deputy. And I want to uh, begin by actually acknowledging also the presence by Annika Söder. Uh, who will be speaking later in the program, but who was uh, our state secretary at the time and really the brain and strategist behind our approach to women, peace and security and, and our feminist foreign policy more, more broadly. So uh, it would be excellent. It's excellent that she's here on the receiving end, if you will, to comment also on the conclusions that you draw in your in your papers. But uh, so and easier for me then to go first and to be able to set out what what our view of, of, uh, of our work uh, is and, and was. Um, I think, I mean, it's important to begin uh, with a context here that uh, this, um, the, the government declared a, a feminist foreign policy uh, from the outset, and this was already back in 2014 uh, uh, or 15, uh, when before we, uh, before we uh, of course, got onto the council. So this was also part of our campaign, if you will. There were those who cautioned us on that and said that, you know, we need to play this down. Uh, it's not popular. But we, uh, we made this one of our uh, centerpieces of our campaign as well, and we stood through uh, and, of course, uh, you know, delivered on that and, and uh, uh, all the way. So then coming to the council, we, uh, we uh, made the Women, Peace and Security uh, the front and, and center, really, uh, of our work. And I'd like to point to maybe uh, three, um, three factors that I think were key to, uh, I don't know if they can be called success factors, but they were key to the achievements and the results that we managed to, to, to bring. The first one is really the consistency in, in our approach. We brought this uh, topic to every meeting, to every item, to, on every occasion. Um, uh, and, we met, and we really insisted on integrating women, peace, and security in the daily work of the council, not a standalone issue that we do on a thematic debate in October or in a product uh, separate to others, but as an integrated issue into everyday council work. Um, and we, we kept that consistency. And so uh, if the, the issue of women peace security were not raised in a briefing or report, we always made sure to ask that question to the SRSG or to the briefer from the Secretariat. Uh, and with time, of course, everyone expected Sweden to bring this issue to the table. And so in advance already, it was part of briefings or reports uh, and, and colleagues uh, around the table who agreed or disagreed with our approach uh, also had to be a prayer, prepared to, to, uh, to respond uh, to the proposals that we brought. So that's number one, really, the consistency, and I should say maybe uh, our, our, the rigorousness in, in which we, we drove this, uh, this issue also as an integrated part. 
The second uh, is um, uh, that we had a contextualized and operationalized approach. Uh, it might sound complex, but the idea here is that we cannot generalize around these issues. We need to be very specific. So when we have a discussion on Mali, we need to know exactly what are the challenges uh, and opportunities uh, in Mali when it comes to peace and women, peace and security, and also then make our comments and suggestions related to that so that they are very country and context specific and that they are also operational. It's not good enough to talk about the challenge, but we also need to have a proposal on how we think that the EU or the UN's approach or the mission's uh, mandate should be then amended or updated in order to try to respond to that challenge and opportunity. And so we really had our embassies out in the field on, our, on their toes uh, to, to every meeting provide the latest and very specific context specific uh, input uh, and also to always ask themselves you know what can be done what can the UN do what can we do uh, to address this issue so that we could have an operational position uh, so contextualized uh, analysis uh, and operationalized positions uh, on the specific uh, topics this was I think uh, number one uh, because then the more general uh, opposition that we could meet from some other council members we could much easier penetrate if we were uh, you know, direct and specific on the concrete issues and how this related to the broader peace and security agenda. The third uh, is um, uh, focusing both on participation and on protection. I mean, often on women peace and security in the past, there has been uh, a, a leaning towards the protection side, uh, sexual violence uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and really, uh, you know, uh, uh, an emphasis on the victims, uh, women as victims. We wanted to balance that and to make sure that at first we put participation uh, and, and the meaningful participation of women in peace processes and elsewhere in political processes. And so that was, uh, you know, it not meaning that we left uh, protection aside, but really putting uh, participation and meaningful participation at the center. And, uh, and, and, and so both participation and protection. Those three, I think, are main kind of lessons learned taking out of that. And I think, you know, in terms of what we then achieved or what we worked on, I mean, I think that it's fair to say now, uh, I think we concluded that all mandates when we ended, uh, all peacekeeping mandates uh, uh, contained women in peace and security reference. Where there had, in, before we entered, <clears throat> been already mandates on women in peace and security, we made sure to strengthen and update those uh, uh, to make them more targeted and, as I said, more operational and more context uh, specific. We also made sure that in every product, uh, I may, I can't uh, vouch for every presidential statement, but certainly we tried on every product. And I think at the end, you know, uh, we, we almost achieved uh, having every product, having these this references coming out uh, of the council. We also worked on getting more uh, civil society organizations working on women's security issues to the council. We certainly um, uh, worked on that during our own presidencies, but also pushed others, also always putting proposals and ideas to other presidencies of including uh, women's civil society participation. Uh, we also worked on, on gender parity in terms of briefers to the council. As you know, it's a, a quite man-dominated environment. And so we, uh, uh, for the first time in our second presidency, made sure that half-half uh, uh, there was a, a full parity in terms of, of briefers uh, uh, to the council, also as a statement of, of, re of reflecting on, on how, uh, how uh, male dominated uh, the council environment is. Uh, another concrete specific proposal we brought and that we delivered on was to bring uh, sexual and gender based violence as a sanctions criteria to, to sanctions regimes. We began, if I, don't, uh, if I recall correctly, in the Central African Republic. But we then brought that same language into Mali and some other uh, uh, context uh, as well. Um, we, of course, worked to try to make the working group on, on women, peace and security even more relevant and more potent, providing input to, to several meetings every month and, and you know, taking away an excuse for missions not to address these issues. Uh, and we also worked hard to get gender experiences to peacekeeping missions, uh, as I said before, requesting all reports and briefings to include these references, and if not, uh, you know, ask questions. Um, and, and I think one of the results really uh, from uh, towards the end of our, of our term was that more and more colleagues around the table 
also attended to these issues. Um, and so, so we had more council members really taking the floor on, on women, peace and security. Uh, not only on the day uh, or the week of women, peace, security, or the meeting specifically on women, peace, security, but as an integrated part when we discuss Sahel or Afghanistan or, or, or other relevant uh, geographic topics. We have then taken that experience uh, first to the EU. We made a push for this agenda in the EU, institutionally, but also uh, in terms of, of the country level work uh, in the PSC and elsewhere. And now this year, of course, to our OSC uh, uh, presidency or chairpersonship. Uh, our approach now has uh, been um, threefold, basically. It's, we call it leadership, number one. Second, resources and capacity. And third, evaluation and, and accountability. Leadership is for us key. Unless the leadership is committed to the agenda, well, you know, nothing will follow from there. So really to push for leadership, everything from top, uh, you know, the, the, the prime minister and down, if you will, the secretary general and down, or the, the secretary general in the OSC, uh, or the chairperson in the OSC and down. So leadership from the top and all through, and to also work there of capacity building. Uh, you know, we understand also there is a lack of knowledge uh, on, on some occasions. And so we have, with Volker Banner Academy and others, worked also on how we can provide also leadership training and capacity building uh, on these topics. So leadership number one. Second has been on resources and capacity. Of course, if you have a leadership that is committed and knowledgeable about this, what they need is our colleagues uh, who understand these issues. They need money and resources uh, uh, to be able to, to set uh, activities in motion. And so also to make sure that organizations themselves prioritize resources and capacity in this field, but also, of course, tap in and, and provide uh, additional funding where, where needed. And thirdly, then on evaluation and, and accountability to really make sure that you know we deliver real results on the ground. And if not, and if this is not prioritized, that there is accountability higher up in the hierarchy. It was easy when we sat on the council because we could then always you know post the, the control question to the SRSG, or we could really be uh, you know in 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 your eye, if you will, in terms of following up that uh, uh, that colleagues in the field delivered on the mandates. It's a bit harder where we are now, but as a big donor, of course, we make sure that in every conversation we have with organizations that have responsibility for delivery, that this is brought up and that they have in place accountability systems that you know, make uh, women peace security part of their own internal uh, appraisal uh, reviews uh, and evaluations of, of programs more, more generally. I think I end here, uh, but again, uh, the, three, the three main takeaways from our experience has been consistency, uh, to contextualize uh, and operationalize our proposals and, and analysis, and to work both on, uh, on participation and protection. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Carl Skev, for, for this really interesting in, uh, overview of, of your experiences from that particular period on the Security Council, also how you are bringing those experiences with you into current policies. And thank you again uh, for taking time to share your, your, your insights with us, both through the research process and the production of this report. Um, as you know, uh, uh, one ambition with this report is to try and come up you know, with concrete guidelines and, and suggestions to not only to Norway, but other elected states on how they can best pursue thematic issues, and in this case, women, peace and security. But I would like to ask you a question, uh, because you, you were referring now to a lot of successes, um, positive outcomes. When you think back, are, are there anything that you maybe think now that you should have done differently? Uh, do you have a, a good advice to a country like Norway or, a, or a, a country like Denmark, who is now campaigning for, for a seat? something that you maybe have been thinking of now following uh, the membership period in, in, in the Security Council? Well, maybe two things. Uh, one is that, um, you know, uh, the, the Council is a very kind of uh, daily agenda driven business. So you can't plan so much ahead. And, and so I think what you really need to do is to leave space for for taking opportunities as they arise. The, the most important contribution we made to council work were, I wouldn't say maybe by coincidence, but were opportunities that arose and having uh, the ability then to see those opportunities, seize them 
and, and have capacity sufficiently to begin delivering on that. So I think that that's one more general lesson that I think um, that I think it can go also for the agenda of peace and security, that really being nimble, flexible, and uh, you know, seeking opportunities and, uh, uh, and be ready when, when those opportunities arise and have that kind of built-in innovative uh, and, and, and you know, uh, mentality in the whole team of seeking those opportunities. And then, of course, 110%, you need to leave a bit of space to be able to have that flexibility and, that, and to move around uh, and, and take opportunities as, as they arise. And that, again, uh, goes also for the women peace security uh, uh, agenda, of course. I think the other is that, uh, and where I think we, we did quite well, is that we linked up very much the field, the embassies with Stockholm and, 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 and New York. That triangle worked very well. Uh, because as I, as I said, when, when we were successful on the women peace security agenda, and more generally as well, it was when we had very concrete uh, proposals to make and, and a very context-specific analysis. And so you really need capacity in the field uh, for this. And that capacity needs to maybe have been there a year or two and have also, uh, you know, uh, been, um, been trained and understand the concepts of, of women peace security, because only then will they be able to see and be able to provide an analysis uh, that is insightful uh, and that comes up with concrete ideas that you can bring to the table. So really, where we had people in the field who understood these issues and had been there for a couple of years, that's really when we could make a difference. Uh, also in terms of getting the input we needed to play a role. And then of course, your team uh, in New York and in Stockholm uh, uh, also uh, makes a, a difference. Uh, you need to have uh, the people there that uh, are ready to, to run and drive uh, these issues. And not least in the end, I would say also have the leadership uh, from the top. I mean, there was no doubt that our foreign minister, uh, our state secretary, our full leadership prioritized this, prioritized this issue every day they woke up. And we all knew that we had to respond to them in terms of how we had moved the agenda forward uh, on a daily basis. So I think those are some elements that I would, uh, you know, I would, I would um, take back um, uh, uh, as, as kind of core lessons for, from that experience. Thank, thank you so much, Carl. I think some countries have already started to implement similar ways of organizing uh, uh, their work and hopefully they will find more input from from this report and uh, so i hope you will stay on uh, listen to the rest of, of the webinar sure. we will now move move to uh, to the report um to the presentation of the report uh and we have with us three distinguished scholars um the three main authors of the report. Um, it's Louise Olson, who is the senior researcher at Brio and leader of, of this project. It's Angela Mouvumba Selström, senior researcher at the Nordic Africa Institute. And it's Patty Chang, who is a senior researcher at Brio and at New York University. And I think I'll leave the floor to you, Louise. You will start out. The floor is yours. Thank you, Tora. Uh, and also, thank you so much, uh, Carl. That was a, a really fascinating uh, presentation. So let me begin also by expressing our, how grateful we are to all of those that have contributed to the project uh, and given us input, and not least, of course, that have participated at interviewees that have been absolutely critical. And I also want to thank my fantastic project team for all their work uh, during this process. Let me also begin by saying that this report is uh, not intended to be an assessment of Sweden's work in the Council, that, but rather that we have tried to learn from Sweden's experiences to explore and expand our understanding of internal Council dynamics and on the role of states for uh, progressing women, peace and security. So I here also very much look forward to Mimi's reflections on how this research can be developed further. Next slide, please. So let me just say a few words about how we approach then the study of elected members. So first of all, then, what is the UN Security Council? Well, as so well described by Carl Skow, it's the highest decision-making arena internationally, very high tempo, very high workload, and very harsh climate often. 
And what does the council then produce? Well, two core outcomes are resolutions and statements. And, and I think in the public eye, that might not seem very impressive. In addition, of course, these outcomes are produced through negotiations. So here it's important to remember that an elected member constitutes one out of 10 elected states, the so-called E10s. And in addition, of course, there are the five permanent members that are in the council long term and that have the veto. And this also means that each member, but particularly elected members, will have a limited impact on each situation on the council's agenda. But if you manage to suggest and get all to agree on concrete and action-oriented language in a resolution, then that will, of course, have critical effects in the lives of people in conflict areas and on the personnel that the UN deploys around the world. So there is always someone on the receiving end of the council's decisions. Next slide, please. How do we then uh, proceed to study the role of elected states in, in this context? Well, I will give you a short overview of our framework that we develop based on research, but also very much true and learn from Sweden's experiences. And then Angela and Paddy will give you examples of, of what we learned more specifically during their term. In the first framework area, we explore the importance of how an elected state prepares for their term, sort of by assessing what forms of opportunities that can exist. So how did Sweden understand and build on ongoing processes on the WPS? And given that the composition of the council changes every year, what were the expected position and capacities of the other council members? And thirdly, in assessing opportunities, there is also a need to take a critical look at oneself. So how did Sweden then perceive its own strengths and weaknesses? In the second area, we then look closer at how an elected state formed its strategy. So how did it Sweden formulate its aim? That is, what does it concretely, as Carl said, want to achieve given the two year time period? And section, how did Sweden then decide on which methods to use to move towards those aim? And thirdly, how did you allocate resources enough to actually move effectively in that direction? In the next part of the framework, we then look at the period in the council and four clusters of conditions that an elected state has to handle. We look at the power hierarchies, which I think that most of us think about when we think about the council, but equally important, we also looked at the working methods, the way in which the council operates and decides. We also looked at the effects of the external dynamics, the role of other member states and civil society outside of the council, and also Sweden's own domestic and internal organizational dynamic that it had to handle during its term. In the fourth framework area, we have then outlined five categories of potential impacts that previous research and policy have sort of used in order to try to understand the effect of an elected member on the council's work. And we use this in an attempt to move away from a sort of estimating impact on some sort of aggregate council level to obtain a more granular view. And of these five, the first two can be thought of as sort of strengthening or seeking to contribute to strengthen the normative framework. So an elected state can raise visibility, for example, from previously overlooked WPS issue, or it can champion a new thematic resolution. The three final ways in which an elected state can sort of seek to have an impact is more directly than uh, connected to implementing the existing framework. So it can seek to reshape the council's working methods, for example, as also brought up a call, how, how to strengthen the informal expert group or increasing the number of women's civil society resources to strengthen uh, information to the council. Another way can be to strengthen sanction criteria to include conflict-related sexual violence. And the third can be to promote the WPS integration into resolutions and statements. And then we, we heard that uh, Sweden tried to have impact in all three uh, all these areas of implementation, but we have focused on the, particularly by studying the, the last uh, point in terms of integration, where Paddy will give us examples of, of how to disaggregate and then measure and trace the implementability of WPS language. As Carl said, it was just critical to moving forward. Uh, and uh, I think we can also, we have tried now to apply this to WPS, but it can also, we hope, be uh, used to understand also elected members work in other policy areas. But Angela, I will now hand the floor to you to give us examples of what we've learned. Thank you so much, Louise. And I want to say also, kind of on behalf of the project team, that we're all very grateful to you for your leadership in this project, um, particularly for your unflagging attention to both the researcher and to the practitioner perspectives. So we developed the framework that Louise has introduced, and this framework um, is a way for us, or was a way for us, to sort through the myriad influences on elected states 
in a fast moving and as you've heard, quickly shifting arena. And arguably, we think that this uh, framework is potential for helping us also assess other thematic areas that elected member states uh, take up. Our approach was to pose questions that were dr driven by these different conditions um, to council representatives, diplomats, Swedish MFA, uh, UN partners, and civil society. In the first uh, cluster, um, I think we can go back, back a slide, back to the other slide. Thanks. In the first cluster, um, we highlighted, we looked at UN Security Council power dynamics and, and tried to take a, a great, a closer look at the way in which the Permanent Five and the E10 interacted. And we assumed, of course, that there would be some resistance from the, the permanent members, uh, for example, on WPS. Um, but there was no real substantial resistance. Uh, resistance was limited about the propositions for robust WPS language. And this can be attributed to several things. It can be attributed to what Carl mentioned, leadership, uh, Swedish, Sweden's feminist foreign policy and the experience of its political leadership generated a kind of authenticity. And this was tactically useful. Um, it can be traced to the cooperation and the networking that Sweden carried out uh, with other E10 elected states. This is actually a trend that we've seen amongst the elected in the last years. Um, it can also be traced also to the fact that Sweden prioritized getting language in early, in early negotiations um, and engaging with the P5 and, and the E10 on that. In the second cluster, we looked at working methods of the Security Council, and this is related to the bureaucratic craft of being in the council. Um, formal methods like pen holdership, uh, presidency, field visits, um, uh, uh, we're all part of that. Uh, um, as Carl has mentioned, you know, the, 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 the presidency was also an opportunity, for example, to advance uh, the input of, 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 of gender parity. So there was male-female balance of briefers. Um, and we expected there would be a lot of problems um, in working methods around the aim of really integrating concrete language in, in council outcomes. Uh, because of the exclusivity, for example, of the pen holdership system. But, but Sweden uh, navigated around this again by focusing on early, early uh, negotiations and early inclusion, but also built a, a kind of nourished a culture, a new culture of accountability uh, within the UN system, within, you know, amongst the secretariat, uh, in the relationship between the secretariat and ambassadors, between the political and bureaucratic levels. And this was very important for kind of creating and generating expectations of accountability that, that everyone had to be more responsive um, and report and think about WPS. In the third cluster, we looked at um, the Security Council dynamics, mostly around uh, the external landscape, the external political landscape between experts and and within a non-governmental sector. And here, the interesting thing was that the group of friends on 1325 played a very important role, um, important in terms of information sharing, coordination, um, helping with delivery of joint statements, but think tanks in academia were also important. And they were important for providing a neutral arena for discussing issues and generating new material, but also important for um, creating some kind of advocacy and energy. Sweden also uh, used a national approach and, and had constituted a reference council nationally with Swedish civil society so that it could regularly discuss and air out issues on the council agenda. The last cluster relates to uh, the E10's own internal dynamics. And this is particularly important given the high tempo and the changing um, uh, urgent matters before the council. Uh, what was interesting to us was that Sweden set up a coordination unit in the ministry that was very important for uh, co collectively coordinating information and ideas throughout the MFA system between geographical units, um, as well as functional units of, on the Security Council and between the MFA and between New York, uh, with New York. And all this happened constantly, simultaneously, in really, really short uh, daily, sometimes hourly cycles. 
Again, political leadership was important here because it really raised the tempo and the urgency on WPS. Um, and also the lessons I think learned with the integration of the feminist foreign policy. This was particularly useful because everyone within the system felt a sense or expressed a sense of, of responsibility for actually integrating WPS. It was not something relegated only to WPS focal points um, or experts, although those, those existed, but WPS was not siloed. So I'm going to finish there and hand over to my colleague, Patty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. And I just wanted to, to also echo Angela's uh, sentiments in terms of thanking Louise for her wonderful leadership and for the opportunity to work on this fascinating project at the moment. I will cover the last two sections on appraising impact and also generally the conclusions. Thank you for the slide. Um, so in terms of an appraising impact, um, assessing the full impact of the individual elected member states and the council is a very complex endeavor if not impossible. So as Louise had mentioned, the report identifies five different forms of effects, two of which are related to strengthening the normative framework and the other three, which are more or less related to strengthening the implementation of the existing WPS resolutions through integration in regular processes. Um, and in terms of looking at language, for instance, we focused more or less on the promotion of integration of WPS uh, and what does that look like in practice? So most assessments tend to count the number of terms that are associated with WPS or simply count the number of times that women appear in a text as a way to understand gender or WPS and how it's reflected in a document. And this approach provides numerically a count of how many times the words are associated with WPS are incorporated, but it tends to say little about the quality and also the consideration in which the language is used. So we use Sweden as work as an example to develop our understanding of how the integration of language, WPS language, in council resolutions can be appraised in terms of three forms of criteria that you see here, in terms of frequency, clarity, and priority. Uh, next slide, Jim, please. So in terms of frequency, that refers to the degree in which uh, WPS is integrated into the resolution. And while this criterion initially uses WPS terms in, to locate the language within the resolutions, it also has the ability to capture indirect language on WPS and maps out the language according to the three themes that we looked at, participation, protection, and gender mainstreaming. And what's important here in this criteria is that it doesn't assert that w, more WPS language in a resolution is better. And what we learned from our data set from 2016 to 19 in this period was that while there was an overall variation in the language, it's evident that there was an increase over time beginning from the later half of 2017. And while protection has the largest volume of references relative to participation and gender mainstreaming, from the first half of 2017, we see that the language on participation and gender mainstreaming started to increase here. On clarity, for instance, this criterion captures the degree in which WPS language is operational, meaning action oriented. And here we examine the language formulated in the generic or general terms versus language that is specific and concrete in terms of tasks and objectives. And we track the language and where it's situated within the resolution, namely only in the preamble section, in preamble and also operative section, or only in the operative section, because for language to be implemented, it has to actually exist in the resolution first and foremost, but it also has to be precise and also appear in the right places. So our data set shows that a high percentage of generic WPS language across all the different types of resolutions in 2016 and 19 were present, especially in peace operations and also in special political missions as opposed to country specific or thematic resolutions. And so the likelihood of implementation is affected by the fact that the majority of the WPS language had a low degree of clarity, meaning that they were not formulated with concrete or action-oriented language. And lastly, on priority, these are measures that are associated with the instructive word associated with the WPS reference or the language itself. Um, and we measure that through an intensity scale. So the resolutions included a number of tasks and objectives in the operative sections and required missions to prioritize. And so the instructive words of the resolutions 
also signal the relative importance of the issue itself. And most WPS language in the operative section were generic without actionable activities, which significantly diminished the likelihood of WPS references that would be likely to be systematically implemented or associated with uh, weaker forms of instructive words. However, there were a cluster of very significant WPS language that was associated in the operative section that was uh, that were coupled with strong instructive words like the term besides. Overall, this report provides an analytical framework that can be used for further structured studies on E10 strategies and conditions in the Security Council. And it allows us to understand how to measure outcomes and systematically identify ways in which to assess opportunities and strengths. Uh, first and foremost, by obtaining in-depth understanding of the ongoing Security Council processes before entering into and taking the seat, but also by identifying concrete gaps in terms of existing policies to be addressed and establishing a cooperation and division of labor amongst the E10 states and building broader alliances across different E10 countries and groupings, um, especially in terms of credibility, competency, resources, and political capital in different WPS themes and sub-themes, for instance. Also in terms of looking at uh, maneuverability, you see the close collaboration between different E10 groups and how to e enable exchange of information and leading to efficient burden sharing types of activities. And also the importance of context relevant information on WPS in specific geographical areas. In terms of uh, the appraisal of the impact, for instance, uh, the last few points are just generally to avoid general generic language in the operative section of uh, the resolutions with the association of WPS language that's there, and also using or incorporating too many WPS demands within these priorities uh, and to balance that within the language itself. So I'll end here. Um, thank you very much for this and I'll return the floor to the next speaker. Thank you so much, um, Patty, uh, Angela, and and Louise for for giving us this glimpse into the main uh, findings and recommendations of the report. Um, as as uh, as Patty said, this is a, it provides an overall analytical framework for how to study uh, the role and impact of E10 on on the Security Council, and this is definitely a framework that we will bring with us into the analysis of how Norway is now. And, uh, delivering on the Security Council. Um, I will now introduce the next speaker. Uh, that's uh, Mimi Söderberg-Kovacs, uh, Söderberg who is the Head of Research and Development at our longtime collaborating partner at the Folke Bernadotte Academy, FBA in Stockholm. And we have invited her to share some reflections from a research perspective about the importance and impact of a report like this. So please, uh, Mimi, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Thuren, and thanks to the researchers for inviting me to read this fantastic report. And for those of you that find the prospects of, of reading a 70 pages something report uh, sort of daunting, I can assure everyone that you can bring this on to you on your summer vacation. Uh, it's such a delightful read. It's beautifully written. It's well structured and really easily accessible for any kind of audience. So I hi highly encourage everyone that participating today to read the report. But don't be fooled by the accessibility of the report, um, that it doesn't have any uh, rigor or that it doesn't build on high quality systematic research. It truly does. Um, this is essentially an excellent piece of research that truly made my day. Um, it's also paradoxically enough, a little bit unusual in its approach, which I think was something that struck me as somewhat surprising. I think we should see a lot more of this type of research. But paradoxically, as I think research uh, generally and specifically on the UN has become more methodologically and technically advanced of sorts and the data is becoming more fine grained, sometimes we lose track of the most sort of easy questions that are in front of us. And, and what this is is simply a kind of classical type of research at its best. You do a brilliant job of sort of combining your and building on these unique interviews of the voices of the people that were directly involved, but you combine it with your systematic data collection. It's theoretically grounded, 
but also close to the empirical realities that we heard a little bit about already today from the actors involved. And you really have the, the possibility of combining what I think is incredibly policy relevant research while being grounded in the research debates. And I think I really wanna make a point about this being a research task that I can truly see the value of doing that. You, while you build on the experiences of the interviews and the actors involved, you have the ability as researchers to also zoom out a little bit of these individual experiences and look at this from the basis of your expertise on about the UN, about the women, peace and security agenda in a much longer time perspective. Your knowledge about the UN, for example, and your knowledge of research, previous research in this, in this field. And hence, I think this is really the type of cooperation between policymakers, practitioners and research that I would like to see a lot more of. And I think it has nothing to do with the lack of, of skills or knowledge of the people that were directly involved or even, in fact, maybe even not even their time, but I think of the combination of the two, um, of the different worlds, I think, uh, is really what truly makes this a great report. And the main strength of the report, I would definitely say, comes through in your presentation today. It really is kind of the, you look at the very concrete implementation of the VPS agenda, concretely within the Security Council. This has not really been done before in the way that you do it. And it's really put into sort of the agenda, the policy agenda into practice. And you could almost read it as a handbook, a kind of a E10 handbook for incoming member states. Um, listen carefully now, Norway. But it's also, um, and in particular, like, what I do like is this, that you take it the, all the way step through. It's from every, from the preparatory work that needs to be done to the strategy, to the specific tactics, and into, and importantly, measuring uh, specifically uh, outcomes and assessments towards the end, which I think you make a brilliant uh, contribution to. What would I, as a, from a researcher to other researchers, one of the things that I value as a researcher, and I think we should bring with us into the practitioner world and the policy world is this sort of seminar culture of also pointing things that we would like to see more of. And one of the things that I was thinking about is, is um, the kind of, and it was brought up in the question that Turin had towards Carl Skow in the beginning. I was curious to learn more about the individual's different experiences of the mistakes that they made or the shortcomings of approaches. So things that, or even failures and what could have been done better. And I think there's a lot of value in learning from those too and critically reflecting on, on, on those experiences. And the other things that I missed a little bit, although this, of course, without a doubt, was a collective effort. There were um, individuals involved, some that are listening in on this seminar today and speaking. And I miss a little bit hearing their individual voices, although, of course, you need to keep the anonymity in a research report. But leaders and leadership matters, as you talk about in the report. And I missed a little bit those voices particularly. And where do we go? Next, I think one of the things that you clearly point out in not least in the conclusions and recommendations of the report is what we need to learn more about is then the link between policy into practice again in the mission contexts. And just as the Swedish team kind of looked at and asked the mission context and people working on this on the ground to ask, what do you need to see in terms of the language and the formulations in the resolutions? We need the researcher to then go back and say, well, what does it matter then in terms of the specific language and the narratives and how it's formulated and where it's formulated and how does this play out in the mission context? Where a lot of other factors then come into play too. What about leadership in the mission context? What about allocation of resources and priorities um, and the other factors that play in in that context? What do we know about the kind of final outcomes between policy and practice in that respect. And this is where I hope that the next sort of generation of research can go in that direction. So thank you very much for this report. Thank you so much, Mimi. I, I at least found your reflections really useful and, and something that we, we as a team definitely will, will bring with us. And from Prio's point of perspective, I really enjoyed that you highlighted the, that this report is so incredibly policy relevant while also being solidly grounded in research and that lies at the heart of our mission at Prio that we would like to 
provide policy input that is solidly grounded in research. We have a, uh, a tight program here, so I think I'll now just have to move straight into the next segment uh, and give the floor to Louise, who will lead uh, a panel or a discussion or what should we call it, dialogue um, on, on Nordic experiences. So uh, please, Louise, uh, back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Torun, and thank you, Mimi, for really, really interesting comments. I'll, I'll, I'll echo Torun, as I will definitely take this uh, uh, with us. Uh, and uh, as Torun also emphasized, we have also been very interested in, in through this event format, to continuing the, uh, the dialogue between policy and research. So therefore, I would be, I would now like to introduce the, the next uh, panel. So I'm very happy to present Marianne Kress, Head of Department for Migration, Stabilization and Fragility, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Denmark. Uh, André Mundal, Special Envoy for Women, Peace and Security at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Norway. And Annika Söder that we have heard so much about. Annika, I'm, I'm really glad you can also be here to provide comments. A special representative of the OSCE Chairperson in Office for the South Caucasus and State Secretary for Foreign Affairs of Sweden from the 2014 to 19 period. Uh, and as I said, we would like to continue this uh, in, in dialogue uh, format. And uh, it's actually interesting. We, we chose this Nordic uh, focus because WPS has been an increased interest to many elected states. Uh, and the Nordic uh, have such a strong history on this. Uh, actually, the first time that Peter Wallenstein, Turin Trigestad, and I worked together was in a, a UN led project that uh, in 99 2000 that resulted in the Windhoek Declaration where we work together with Swedish, Norwegian, Danish, and Finnish colleagues. So this seems like a very suitable way to continue the dialogue. So I will begin by asking our panelists a round of, of questions. And uh, uh, after that round, I will also pose uh, some joint questions to the whole panel. But as the pandemic is also affecting our program a little bit, Andre, I know that you have to take a short time out in the middle of our program to reconnect from the train as you're on your way to get vaccinated. I would really like to just first turn to you and ask about Norway's ongoing work in the Security Council. So uh, in the statement on Norway's priorities for your term, it says that Norway will make use of our knowledge of women, peace and security agenda and integrate this area into all the Council's work. Norway can help ensure that women's participations and rights are safeguarded in UN peace and security efforts. So we are now very curious if you can tell us about what that practically means for Norway uh, to work on WPS in the Council and also how the current dynamics among states in the Council are affecting your work. And in addition, uh, if you can say something about what you see as, as perhaps both the positive, challenge, positive achievements, but perhaps also some challenges uh, during these first six months. Thank you so much, uh, Louise. Uh, this has been uh extremely interesting i'm uh, taking note uh, notes like a madman um, unfortunately i also have this uh, knack of uh, putting things that are important uh, up on the walls in my office so i think it will be be painted with uh, things that we need to remember when uh, when we are in the council uh, but uh, in in many ways um, i hope and think that we are uh, sort of picking up from the, the very good work that, uh, that Sweden did. And uh, these, uh, I, I also took notes of these uh, three uh, main points that uh, Carl made about uh, consistency in, uh, in the approach uh, on every occasion and integrating this in all types of work. And I, I really hope that this is something that we also can achieve, that we are focusing on. And, and uh, our slogan being a consistent partner, it, it is really something that we should uh, deliver on. And, and then also uh, be specific, uh, knowing exactly what uh, the challenges uh, are and uh, direct them uh, with, a, with a very targeted uh, approach. And then also participation uh, versus protection, um, which is very, interesting and something that we are uh, debating continuously on a on a sort of a strategic level uh, if there is a if there is a sort of a focus of legacy that we are going to put uh, behind us uh, what would that be and you know from uh, from our point of view there is no uh, 
there is no sort of a conflict in between the two, but but sadly we we see that often out there in the world there is a bit of a conflict between them, and it's a feedback that we often get from uh, civil society as well that you know we need to deal with the protection aspects, but what women out there want in these processes to, is to be taken seriously as participants, as actors. So we are very mindful of, of how to uh, navigate that territory in the best possible way and to emphasize participation always and also keep saying that, you know, we are not having this conversation about protection of women because women need to be protected because they are women, but it's because of the culture and laws and, and all of these things that are hindering women for, from, from, taking, uh, from reaching their, their potential. Um, for our system, I think, like, what is our number one strength as, as a Norwegian Foreign Service? I would say that we are sort of feeding off the long-term mainstreaming of gender equality women's rights and women peace and security. And you, you can't fake that. Uh, this, is a, this is a decades long, many decades long tra tradition we have. It's very in, uh, integrated in our system. And uh, that really guides and helps our daily work on council processes. Because when, when I engage my colleagues at our embassy in Mali or embassy in Colombia or wherever, this is not foreign to them in any way. This is a priority for them. They work with this. They have worked with this for, for years. So we sort of, our starting point is, is, from, a very, is from a very good place. And, you know, we, we don't have a, a big women, peace and security office in the, in the ministry. And, you know, sometimes I, I miss that. But, but then again, the advantage of having all of my colleagues leaning forward of this issue, knowing the issue, it's uh, it absolutely uh, it's it's an advantage that uh, that we have. And then I would mention uh, mandates also specifically, right? Because like mandates is the is the process where you they are important because they have an operational impact, and you also know when they will come. So that's where we work really. Thoroughly, we have early meetings between uh, me and uh, the desk and uh, the embassy. You know, what are we going to look for? What type of meetings do we need to have in in, uh, in advance in order to to get uh, the feedback we kind of need to be specific when that uh, process uh, comes up? And I also saw I I've been reading a report, of course, and I I uh, I think you have some some great. Uh, conclusions that are absolutely going up on my wall. And you also have this one about, you know, how to engage our embassies and wider foreign uh, service uh, staff. Uh, and it's also interesting that, you know, on the other side, you also mentioned this um, uh, incorporating too many women peace and security demands, right? Which is something that we also need to be wary of because there are also budget processes uh, involved there right so we you know we need to uh, to address that as well we we want to be targeted specific and also to put something into a mandate for example that actually can be uh, achieved and i want to and i want to say that our very close and broad collaboration with civil society is also uh, it's also uh, paying off because you know we can never know everything we we just can't so we, uh, we value that collaboration uh, so much and we're always open for uh, suggestions from, from civil society. And then uh, to close off uh, this first question, we're working with other members, right? I mean, there are several other members in the Security Council that are now ambitious on women, peace and security, which is great. In one way, it sort of narrows the space for where we can put our efforts because we are not going to be the ones that stumble in other feet, right? We, we want to be uh, joining forces with other ambitious actors on women, peace and security and, and uh, so that we can 
lift where others are not lifting and talk together. And uh, I think that aspect of sharing the load with other members as well is, uh, is very, very important. Uh, but thank you again for uh, for all this input, by the way, that it is really valuable for, for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Andrea. Before I, I, I let you uh, roam towards the vaccine, can I, I ask a, a, a follow up question? Because I think before you, you entered the council, there were some concerns raised about the high profile WPS. One was that uh, making it a, a making promoting women and inclusion in peace processes. Uh, where there were fears that that could sort of negatively affect the, the image of being sort of neutral in terms of the other priority, which is peace diplomacy. And another concern raised, and I think we also heard this when we did the study on, on uh, Sweden, was that when you as a state very clearly proclaim what your highest priorities are, that also makes you vulnerable to others who wants to, to trade and negotiate uh, to, to sort of use that uh, very clear profile. So could you say something about these concerns, how you, you thought around them, and, and if anything like this has come up during the council term? Yeah. I mean, uh, we. This is a neutral uh, subject, right? And I, I, you know, it's not perceived like that everywhere. But but that's how we're going to uh, to to address it. We, we can't have, you know, having half of the population involved in key questions of of society can't be anything but a uh, a neutral question. Um, we have a long tradition in, in doing this, right? So uh, this is where the consistent partner comes in. I mean, this is not nothing new for us. We have been, um, we've been having these values outside of the council and, and peace and diplomacy through peace and reconciliation. We've done that for 30 years and we've done women, peace and security for, for decades. And we have uh, sort of gone down that path uh, all along, and it's uh, we don't see it as a as a trade off in any way, and we're not gonna gonna allow ourselves to open that door to to that being some sort of a trade off uh, neither. So, um, and of course, um, there 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 are always I can't remember any specific uh, situations right now where we have been asked whether we could take something out to get uh, something else in but uh, of course that that uh, might happen but uh, you know we we uh, have a uh, solid uh, priority on on this and for you know it's women peace and security but for us this is peace and security this is uh, this is about women yes but it is uh, it, it's all about peace and security and and that's how we're also uh, treating this uh, issue, so so if it comes up, uh, we will deal with it. But we have a we have a long uh, tradition uh, in doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I also hope that we will be able to to reconnect you to discuss more questions uh, uh, later. Marianne Kress, uh, let me now uh, turn to you. Uh, we are very interested and, and curious, of course. Uh, to learn uh, more about Denmark as you are now uh, starting to prepare for the campaign. So let me ask you this. Denmark was the first uh, country to adopt a national action plan in 2005. And in your fourth and current plan, it stated that the WPS agenda is, uh, just as uh, Andre also said, foremost a sec security policy agenda. And therefore, the first pillar of the Danish action plan focuses on how Denmark will strengthen its effort for women, peace and security. So could you begin by describing to us uh, how Denmark works currently on WPS in the UN setting and also give some examples to us of, of what it means uh, to strengthen your work on WPS. I know, for example, that you recently come back uh, from Mali. And we are also, of course, very, very curious and interested to learn more about the campaign for the 2025 to 26 uh, term. So uh, we are also really wondering if you could say something about that and, and how, how and if you will address WPS in that. Please, Marianne, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. And first of all, thank you to all the organizers. Uh, we are in the what we call a big listening mode. I think it's extremely interesting what you have been presented. And we will, of course, also carefully read your, your the report. 
as you said, we have just launched our, our National Action Plan 2020-2024, which is a joint, uh, was jointly launched by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Defence, but also our Minister of Justice. And as you said, we have had several experience. We also had an evaluation of, of, of the implementation of our action plans. And sometimes we actually what we saw how to, were we actually able to have the results and the impact we wanted and we have not always been as good at this as we wanted and one of the things we have taken forward now is to have a very concrete implementation plan so we have a very concrete plan for what we're going to do this year and we have a new one next year and the following years and each responsible ministry will have uh, their own uh, plans so we have an implementation plan, and as you said, the uh, one is uh, working as, as on women, peace and in Denmark as a security actor, but also on women's active participation in peace and security, and then on sexual and gender-based violence and conflict situations. And this plan set out really concrete actions on how we are going to want to work with the UN, with the EU, but also very much at the country level. As many of us, the Sweden and Norway, we have huge engagements in Somalia, but also in the Sahel, in Afghanistan, etc., where we also promote this agenda, have very concrete action on how we want to do it. This is everything from working with civil society on the political agenda, the political dialogue, racing in the, in, in, in the EU, Peace and Security Council, et cetera. So, so I don't want to go into all, the, all, all the, the details, but somehow when we look at our security uh, actions, we want to look at also through a, a gender lens and analyze what consequences does this have for women? How are women involved? And we want to, to ask uh, the question. So when we talk about the UN reform agenda, this is also part of that uh, dialogue. We work, we support uh, UN women's work and part of our results framework actually is around women, peace and security. We also support the, the peace building fund where we also will pursue this, um, this agenda. So these are some of the examples of how we, how we work with it and how we will continue to work on this uh, agenda. Uh, as you said, Denmark has launched this candidature, but we are still in the early days of the of the campaign. We are three years ahead. Uh, there's three years in front of us. It's in 2024, and uh, but of course we are already in the process of, of, of shaping this uh, campaign. And part of that is of course also narrowing in on our priorities and how we are going to work on on, on different issues um, as a potential member of the council. But I, I think uh, it's safe to say <laughs> that we will uh, keep on having women, peace and security on the agenda. And it is an important part of our work uh, if we become member of, of, of the council. And I think it reflects the both what was presented by Norway and Sweden that this is, this is kind of part of our blood, I was going to say. I mean, Gender issues this is something that longer Sweden has been extremely strong, Norway has been extremely strong on this, and then, and then we will continue to be, to be very strong on this uh, issue on, on, on women's rights. Um, uh, we will, in our council, will promote a rights based approach to peacekeeping, focus on human rights, protection, civilian equality. And we will also have a strong focus on promoting role and participation of women in peace and security efforts. And uh, I know, I mean, you all agree on this, uh, that, the, that there will be no peace without women. And I say it was very rightly said uh, by Andre that the, it's, not, it's not women, peace and security, it's just <laughs> security <laughs> and peace. And of course, women are a part of it. We are women. We are half of the half of the population in this uh, this globe. So, so I think that was really a nice way to 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 put it. Um, I also think that when when also that has been confirmed when I'm listening to to the other speakers that this is not something that Denmark would take up if we elected uh, on our. For, for two years, this is a continuous work by, with uh, us, the Nordic like-minded, but other, with other members of the Security Council. So we will 
we will we will build on what has already been done and we will consolidate it and we will further strengthen it. I think that will be our approach. And I think this webinar where we discuss this experience has been is extremely uh, is extremely helpful. And and I also would just want to mention that we already have a very excellent you know continuous dialogue actually between Sweden, Norway, and Denmark where we actually discuss both the candidatures but also the whole work on women. Peace and, and, and security, and we will we will strengthen this and our engagement in all these uh, discussions. Thank you. So that's what I want to say as all issues. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and sort of building on on a, a follow up question related to what you you said, because I, I think it's really come across in our study as well. And, and sort of, can you uh, among the Nordic like minded and, and your cooperation, could you describe a little bit how you work uh, among the Nordic states? And as there's Something in particular uh, in this Norway and Sweden's experiences that you that you think that this could be particularly relevant for for moving forward. I think I think there has been several um, action taken. Also, jointly by our ministers of foreign affairs and made a joint declaration on women, peace, and security, and taken some very I really on the joint principles. And, and I think one of the joint principles was, was continue to ask the questions, meet the, the women. And I think some of these very concrete action also from the political leaders are extremely important to push this uh, agenda forward. But I really, really also like the, the, uh, the summary of, uh, of, uh, of Karl Skog uh, on the consistencies, uh, bringing to all messages. I really like that advice. And also the thing about contextualizing it is important that we are concrete. What does it actually mean in Mali or Afghanistan? What do we want to do? And also because, I, as you said, I just came back after three years in Mali. And it took a long time to get women <laughs> as part of the CSR, which is the committee that follows the implementation of the peace accord. It took a very long time. And one can ask oneself, it's, we had this uh resolution for 20 years and still we have an issue about having the women included from the beginning so so i think this about be consistent and be concrete and specific on proposal and i also like the the the, the measures on participation that we have to see women uh, as also as assets for for building peace uh, and not only as uh, as as uh, victims and what was mentioned both, I think, by, by Sweden and Norway was also this, this issue that we build on something. We have worked on women's issues, women's rights, gender mainstreaming, et cetera, for long. This is expected of us. We have an obligation on this agenda. So that, I think, also is something that we will, um, which is, a, well, which is an extremely important basis and, and for, for our commitment to this, but also our ability to actually have results on this uh, agenda. Um, I like the uh, I like the uh, the issue also about uh, flexibility and seizing opportunities. I'm not the person who have followed uh, the work in the, in the council, but when I read the the dynamics and I talk with colleagues, I can really see this is also something that needs to be uh, which is an important lesson. So um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's really valuable to get your, your external expert uh, question and, and, and listening to your thoughts. Annika Söder, uh, I would now really like to, to turn to you. We are, of course, really interested to hear uh, if you have reflections uh, on the report, but I would also like to ask you two specific questions. So you worked in the highest decision-making position at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in, in Stockholm, and I think uh, during the, the Security Council term, and I think, like Carl said, you, you sort of you personify the importance of senior leadership for uh, moving forward on women, peace, and security. And you were also the one delivering the speech to the Council in the open debate in 2016 as you were preparing to enter where you uh, coined the phrase that we used in the introduction, that WPS is core council business. And of course, as, as was also saying on very much in, and we did a study that placed a very clear demand also on the internal organization of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Stockholm and in New York, uh, on that it should integrate WPS in its own regular work, sort of live as one preaches the credibility that, that everyone has talked about. 
So if you reflect on Sweden's term uh, from the perspective of your senior leadership, so can you tell us sort of what, what, what did leading the work on, on integrating WPS mean in, in, in practice? So how did you make sure that it got uh, uh, included? And also now you have a very, very senior position as uh, during Sweden's chair of the organization of uh, the OSE uh, uh, chairmanship. So can you also tell us about sort of how Sweden uh, promotes WPS in this setting and also how you work in your high level function uh, during the chairmanship uh, on WPS? Uh, Annika, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Luis, and many, many thanks to all the uh, uh, authors of this very, very useful report. But let me say already at the outset that, of course, we consider our contribution useful and meaningful, and we are happy that many countries are now uh, following this up, but the impact on the ground, uh, as was alluded to by some of the speakers, we really need to focus on that. And I believe Mimi also said that in her in intervention, shouldn't, wouldn't that be the next research process to actually see, or project, to actually see what, what kind of impact have we achieved? And that was the idea with my speech in, in 2016, to say that this is a budgetary and financial matter, we need to allocate resources, the other aspect was data. Uh, do we have enough sex disaggregated data to actually know what is going on on the ground? And the third, how can we situate that the UN countries responsible for missions or under UN Security Council mandates, how they actually take action on this? Um, when it comes to what we uh, did back home, we had already started when uh, the government took office in October uh, 2014. We had already started uh, the process of making everyone in the ministry active on the feminist foreign policy. And this, I would say, in a way, was conceptually maybe the easiest one for all uh, our colleagues to, to understand and to, and to grasp. And the systematic process we had where very often Margot Wallström in the morning meetings asked, where are the women? <laughs> Soon also uh, led to a, a strong implementation in all the UN uh, work um, without uh, us uh, having to um, put requests and demands on the organization uh, all the time. I wanted to make a few comments also what has been said also when it comes to the Danish campaign don't be afraid of having a gender lens and a gender perspective. We had that among our priorities as we ran for the Security Council. And my understanding of the international climate is that this is actually accepted and expected from the Nordic countries to be something that we care for. Um, building on the E10 is of course important. Uh, we had a principled approach and we had uh, a structure for E10 cooperation. Uh, they sit on the hidden veto with the 10 uh, votes, but as a matter of fact, that was never really uh, a topic in the women, peace and security uh, context. But I would also like to add that the geopolitical context today, uh, and as it was when we came into the council in 2017, is complex when it comes to the normative work. So uh, at that time we had the uh, uh, US president Trump and expectations uh, from uh, our side that it would not be easy to work on thematic issues, bearing in mind also the views that we sometimes had to deal with from the permanent members of being China and, and Russia. Today, uh, geopolitics are of course extremely difficult. Russia has uh, hardened its position. So still, uh, what can look as a strategy to have language entered into each and every uh, uh, mission mandate or uh, UNSC uh, text uh, was at that time a necessity, the obvious way forward, and may still be uh, uh, the way forward since the thematic work is quite difficult. I'll come back to that also when it comes to my concrete work now in, in South uh, Caucasus. So what we can see from the report is how we also moved uh, from protection being the dominating uh, feature to participation. And here I'd like to make a comment that they are interlinked. Um, participation can actually uh, provide, 
protection. It could also, as we know, in many contexts, be the other way around, that participation uh, can create safety and security problems for active women. Uh, so the, uh, they are interlinked, and, and I believe it's important to remember that when we look at the, the pie charts that you, that you presented. Um, the UN dilemma in the field is, of course, that in most of the conflict contexts we are dealing with um, civil war or the aftermath of civil war, and the UN needs to uh, work with the host uh, country in one way or, or the other. Uh, so when we try to hold the entire UN system accountable, resident coordinators, UN women, other funds and programs and, and agencies and, and military um, peace uh, operations, um, we need to give them better tools to actually follow up uh, the Security Council resolutions. And so this takes me back to what I said about the impact on the ground. Uh, and I believe that the fact that we have the notion of national responsibility in many of the fragile countries and conflict settings also requires more uh, requests for their responsibility when it comes to involving their entire uh, population in peace efforts in order for the conflicts not to, uh, to relapse. Um, here for us, civil society was of key importance and I saw there was a question in the chat also related to how we work with civil society. Uh, the people that worked in New York had very close contacts with all the civil society organizations uh, active in New York. We had a special uh, group uh, that we worked with in Stockholm to get advice. We made um, trips to missions to investigate together with civil society to actually have a reality check what was actually happening on the ground. And, Coming back to Mali, the only example I can think of where we actually saw uh, that women um, peace activists or peace builders had been reached by the UN uh, Security Council uh, resolution was in Mali when our uh, UN ambassador Olof Skog visited. He met women that said, thank you for this, uh, for this Security Council resolution. It means something uh, to us. Then of course, it's a, it's a tough a job to move, uh, to move ahead. Uh, with this. Um, I'd like to mention also the peace building work. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to make headway in the, in the Security Council. And that is why it's equally important to work with the Peace Building Commission, the Peace Building Fund that was mentioned, and other instruments there where it may actually be easier since it's not as stigmatizing to be uh, uh, involved in the PBC work as it, it is to be uh, on the Security Council. Uh, list. Uh, finally, um, my work in, uh, in the Georgian conflict and in the South Caucasus in general uh, shows a complete disinterest in bringing women into the process from most sites uh, that we work with. Uh, we have to also go around the normative fear that comes from uh, some countries like, like Russia. Uh, it seems we are now successful in bringing uh, gender issues onto the agenda of the negotiations around the Georgia conflict, uh, but still we're only managing the conflict, we're not solving it, and still uh, it's more up to us, the mediators, than we can expect uh, the sides, the negotiating parties, to actually uh, bring women's perspectives or bring women in to uh, participate in the delegation. So we have a very, very long way to go uh, and I believe that in most country settings, we, also, we cannot only work with the normative work in the Security Council, which is extremely important, but we also have to work with, with, the, with being there on the ground, checking what is going on, putting pressure on mediators and, and make uh, the environment for, for civil society and women activists uh, safe and secure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annika. And, and let me also do there a, a final uh, follow up question, uh, and then I'm going to hand the, the floor to the director of NAI. Uh, but asking you the same question as Carl, and I think Carl, and also what I think Mimi raised sort of is there something looking back uh, at the council term that you think 
you should have done differently that you 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 really learned that you really want to give us a recommendation to to current or future uh, elected uh, states i think i was uh, hinting at it um and it's about uh, securing the impact and the sustainability of what we do I think we were good at handing over the baton to Germany and now we see brilliant work by Norway and others who will follow, possibly also some of the permanent members. But to actually work more through our embassies or friends' embassies where we have missions to actually uh, secure this uh, work on, in the field um, and to work with the UN system from the Secretary General to the funds, programs and agencies, the, the Department for, for Political and Peace Building Affairs in the Secretariat to see to, uh, to it that when prior, priority is given to this, it's also followed up, that we have good reporting back, following up on what is actually promoted in the, in the resolutions and appropriate funding coming for uh, the actions that are necessary to actually fulfill what has been uh, said in the in the resolution. So we tried a couple of times uh, to bring important actors in the secretariat together, but I believe we could have done more. We could have also have linked the very uh, knowledgeable civil society uh, led by women's organizations around the world, link them to the permanent members so that we do not uh, ourselves, the usual suspects, uh, we do not have to um, carry this uh, issue forward um, only on an, an, a non-permanent uh, basis, but also through the permanent members. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think those are very, very good and great words to, to end this uh, uh, panel with. So I really, really want to express my uh, gratitude to all uh, participants, Annika Söder, uh, Marianne Kress and Andre Mundahl for taking the time to be with us today. I know exactly how busy you are, so it's fantastic to have the opportunity for you to, to participate. And I also think it's very clear that this is um, a dialogue that we can continue. It, it's so much to learn. And uh, let me just again say how much we learned from doing this study. It was a fascinating, one of the most fascinating studies I've done. Uh, so, uh, with that, I will now like to give the floor to Therese Schemander Magnusson, the director at the Nordica Africa Institute, for her closing reflections. Thank you so much, Louise. It is my true privilege to, to close this event, this Nordic dialogue, uh, highly interesting, and to offer thanks to everyone who has been involved. But before I do, let me just briefly uh, share two reflections from, from the report, but also from the discussions that we have heard here today, both with reference to the critical component of knowledge and information sharing. First, that the elected states can really advance positive women, peace and security outcomes by creating systems for gathering and sharing information with another. Exchanging information is fundamentally important for effective cooperation, not the least in the UN Security Council. And secondly, referring to what was also emphasized by Carl Skow here today, the need for contextualized information. This includes information, of course, from states and, and civil society where NGOs and think tanks and academia can really support and complement approaches taken by the elected states. And my own experience speak to this last point when I earlier in my career was heading the department working on water diplomacy at the Stockholm International Water Institute, CWI. And in that capacity, I was part of the Swedish MFA consultation group of civil society during its membership in the council, the, the group that Annika Söder referred to. And it, that group really, and participating in those discussions and briefings provided us with an opportunity to share concrete experiences and examples from Africa, but also in the Middle East, about how we supported the empowerment of women in peace building efforts, 
and also women's effective role in negotiation process uh, on a highly conflict sensitive natural resource, namely international waters. And I believe that such exchanges help to inform the ideas and positions of the Swedish government from the bottom up. I, I think it was uh, fitting to recall that experience today and it really attests to the opportunities that civil society offers to the elected states. Now, on behalf of all of us, let me close by expressing our um, appreciation to all who contributed to both the report and to this launch today. Thank you to all the partners, PRIO, Folkebernadot Academy, Uppsala University Department of Peace and Conflict, and of course, to all of my colleagues at the Nordic Africa Institute. Thank you, Toren and Louise, for brilliant facilitation of the discussions. And uh, let me express how grateful we are for the support from the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs. And during the, the Nordic dialogue that we had here today, we learned so much from the viewpoints from the Nordic Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Carl Skau, André Mundal, Annika Söder and Marianne Kress for sharing your perspectives, but also detailed insights from Norway, Sweden and Denmark. And of, of course, a collective thank you to my counterpart at Trio, Henrik Udal. Finally, to our audience, uh, thank you so much for watching and for your comments and questions in the uh, posting the Q&A. I hope it has inspired future conversations and I sincerely hope that we will soon see you again. For those of you who are based here in the Nordic region, uh, let me wish you a happy midsummer celebration on Friday. To everyone, thank you for joining and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. This webinar is hereby closed.